Before you listen to the Tech Talk Daily podcast, I have to ask, are the high levels of uncertainty you're experiencing keeping you from making bold moves? Are you able to clearly see and act on the game-changing opportunities that pandemic has created? I'm Daniel Burris, serial entrepreneur, global technology futurist, and disruptive innovation expert. And right now, you have a choice to make. You can react to problems and disruptions after they happen, or you can learn to accurately anticipate disruptions before they disrupt and identify and pre-solve problems before they happen, giving you the ability to turn disruptive change into your biggest advantage. If you want to take control of your future and make a significant impact now and in the years ahead, join thousands of leaders from around the world by becoming a member of my Anticipatory Leader System, where you'll get the latest insights, processes, tools, and virtual coaching that will give you the certainty and confidence you need to actively shape a better future for you and your organization. Go to techblogwriter.co.uk and click on Daniel Burris. Welcome to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, where you can learn and be inspired by real-world examples of how technology is transforming businesses and reshaping industries in a language everyone can understand. Here is your host, Neil C. Hughes. Welcome back to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast. Now, there have been many, many changes this year. I think they've all been well documented, but together... I think we've all evolved and adapted quite well, and not just by sharing tech solutions, but the human stories behind them and how people have pivoted to still succeed this year. And so for hearing those stories and for you sharing your insights too, I'm still quite positive about things. But today's guest is Christopher Rigg, and he's the COO and financial services leader at EKI Digital. And he drives all aspects of the business from leading operations, client project delivery, sales and resource management. And he's also an expert on the shift in business operations and digital transformation. He's just sweeping across every industry at the moment from remote work, from remote teamwork, learning to sales and customer service to critical cloud infrastructure and security. And here's a proven leader who has managed large transformation programs, $25 million plus we're talking, and large global teams, over 1,500 people and so much more. We've got a lot to talk about today. I don't want to reveal any spoilers, so buckle up and hold on tight so I can beam your ears all the way to Chicago so we can speak with Christopher Rigg from EKI Digital. So a massive warm welcome to the show. Can you tell the listeners a little about who you are and what you do? Sure, yeah, and and thank you very much uh, for having me. So yeah, my, my name is Chris Rigg. I am currently the COO for a tech company here in Chicago called EKI Digital. I've worked in the tech space for many, many years. Uh, lived Always lived in Chicago uh, since college and then... Um, Worked in the tech space. I've worked at a number of places. I had a long career at Accenture and then Bank of America, IBM, Ernst & Young, and then ultimately uh, I've landed here at EKI Digital, where we focus very much on helping clients use technology to improve their business. And as someone who obviously enjoys leveraging technology to improve client experiences, increase revenue, and enhance operational efficiency and all that cool stuff, I'm curious, can you remember where that passion for technology came from? You know, it's 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 an interesting story. I, when I was in college, the first time that I went to college many many years ago, I didn't study computer science. I actually studied economics. And uh, my senior year of college, I was working part time for an insurance company, and I had one of those mind numbing jobs of of what they call a rater, which is the person that calculates the price of an insurance policy, and you know, kind of inbox outbox work, very manual, looking things up in notebooks, writing things down, using a calculator. And I just came to the conclusion at one point after doing this you know, job a few hours a day in the evening, that there must be a way to automate this. So I actually used the computer that was on my desk. It was an IBM PC, had a built-in basic interpreter, which was you know, the early language that people wrote a lot of programs in. And I actually wrote a program to automate my job. And that was really, I think, which started to put that spark and made me realize at that age, I think I was 21 at the time, that this is really what I wanted to do, even though I originally had not intended to do that. I really liked how you could create things in technology, how it was a creative activity, how you could build something, how you could make things better. I really, you know, that's probably what started it for me. 
Love that. And here in 2020, of course, most businesses are, are all now having to adapt to evolve in the digital landscape. But, but can you tell me more about EKI's Shift Happens campaign, which I've been reading about recently, and how it aims to educate people on how businesses can thrive during this ever-increasing digital shift that's, that's currently underway? Because it's a global thing affecting every business and indeed every individual, isn't it, right now? Absolutely. I, I think that and, and I think it's hard to even overestimate the impact that digital is ha- already had and is going to continue to have. And I still think we're at the very early stages. I think with the shift happens, one of the things we wanted to focus on is how has digital changed everything? How has it changed the way companies make money, the way they serve their clients, the way they treat their employees, all aspects? It's really permeating everything that we do. And I think, you know, that shift is forced people to rethink how they go about doing business, how they add value to their clients. And I think one of the things that we're seeing is what I would call kind of almost like the third wave of digital, which is really focused on business model changes. How do you look at the way in which the value that you bring to your clients has changed as a result of digital? It's not just creating an app or creating a digital experience or automating certain functions. It's really how can I just completely change the way in which my customers work? You know, there's a great example in the investment banking industry. There's a company called Axial Networks, and they actually created an online exchange for companies that want to sell themselves to private equity firms that want to buy them. So they're jokingly referred to as the Tinder of investment banking. Mm-hmm. And so instead of having a you know banker meet with a banker, have them identify buyers for your business, charge you a big fee, they just pay a flat rate fill out a profile on an online system. They have an algorithm that says, yes, these are buyers that are interested in businesses like yours. They do an introduction and the deal can get done. And they've done something like $25 billion worth of transactions. To me, that's you know a great example of how I don't think that particular industry, anybody would have thought of that without all these advances in technology that you can actually you know, completely change the core value proposition for how you bring buyers and sellers together. And I think something we've all learned this year is those digital transformation efforts, which felt like a nice to have, have suddenly been ramped up and had to be squoze through in in what, a couple of months or even sooner in a lot of cases. For for, for businesses that are unsure of what to do and how to evolve quickly enough, what do you think the secret is to to planning for the ongoing shift when it happens? Yeah, I I think you make a great point. And, you know, one of the things I've heard a lot of a lot of talk about is this concept Do they call it kind of like the 10 year leap or the 10 year shift when that e-commerce as a percentage of retail transactions had been growing at something like 1% a year. And it grew by 10% basically like in April. And Mm -hmm. so you think about, you know, what would your business look like if you could move forward 10 years, obviously you would think that there'd be a lot of changes to your business over that 10 year period. But since you've had this almost 10 year shift in a one month period, you really have to recognize that you don't you don't have the luxury of time um, because technology is so ubiquitous and it's so democratized when you think about it today. You can through cloud computing and all of the you know development tools that are available today, almost anybody can start a business with very little upfront investment. So if you have a good idea, you can launch something and all of a sudden you're facing competitors that maybe you didn't know about and they can sneak up on you much quicker than they would in an earlier time when maybe you had to spend more time, more capital to get a business off the ground. So I think that's one of the challenges which really makes it so that you have to get started. You have to do it quickly. And I think the other thing that you've seen is as these business have changed as a result of, say, like the pandemic, you think about you know all these restaurants that had to go from in-room dining to delivery, and the ones that had made investments ahead of time that already had you know, online ordering and um, the ability to interact with their clients digitally, obviously were able to adapt to the change much faster than ones who didn't have that. So it's a lot easier to add curbside pickup to an already online experience where if you're just starting where the only way that clients would interact with you would be show up at your site or call you on the phone. So I think it, it it's really demonstrated that the clients that have been out in front or the companies that have been out in front making those investments have been able to reap the benefit of those investments as this shift has happened as, as more and more of the interaction with customers has gone digital. 
And I think there will be some people listening to us talking today that are finding the current challenges quite daunting. But can you tell me a bit more why you think it's actually never been easier to be smarter and faster? Yeah, I think that I think the easier concept and um, and that may sound like, you know, uh, a a trivial term or maybe self-serving in the sense that, you know, I'm in the business of trying to help clients do this. But um, I think it goes back to what I was saying around technology. It's it. Technology has just become so democratized that you can access this technology much easier. You can make change with this technology much faster. You think about it, you could create something, get a cloud instance, get it up and running. You can scale that very quickly. So you really have much more flexibility to experiment, try new things, do things quickly. You know, people talk about the concept of failing fast or, um, you know, how, how do you quickly determine whether or not what you're doing is working? And obviously, the faster you can iterate on something like that, the better you're going to be, because then you'll be able to lock down on the ideas that, you know, are actually going to work. So if I can test something in a week versus testing it in two months, then I can test 10 more ideas in that same time frame, And then I'll be able to, you know, be much more effective in, in trying to advance my business. And I read a great quote from you recently where you said, I think it was volatility plus tech technology acceleration equals a reason to start now. But can you put that into some context and expand on that a little? Sure. Yeah. You know, I think from a volatility perspective, I think what's causing the volatility is you have competitors that can spring up from almost anywhere. And when you think about, you know, different business models and how they're impacting. You look at, say, Robinhood, for example, You know this idea of completely free trading and how they've been able to go from zero to 20, 30 million clients in a very short period of time on the back of this free, on the back of gamification, on the back of you know really approaching what has been an industry that's been around forever uh, in a completely different way. Now, all of a sudden, you've got new people choosing to, to do investing, opening accounts, doing all of these activities. And it's just, you know, the, the volatility of that is incredible. If you were a traditional player in that industry, all of a sudden you're looking down the road and you see a competitor that has maybe more clients than you do already. And, you know, so I think that that volatility is really driven by just the fact that anybody from anywhere can go after you. I think that, um, and, and so what that means is with the technology acceleration, then, is you have to start now. If you don't start now, you're going to find yourself facing competition that is probably in a much better shape than by the time you realize that they're ready, right? And maybe I'm not being very articulate there, but what th- what that means is you think about it, you know, I-, I might have this competitor and I think, well, you know, they're probably five years away from really being, you know, capable of attacking my core business. But what we're seeing now with technology acceleration is you don't have five years. Maybe you don't have five months. And you know, with, with the technology acceleration and also what we're seeing, certainly in a lot of the fintech industry where I spend a lot of time in financial services is these companies, they're going after certain segments of the market. So maybe when you think about it, you know, you're like, well, they're not going after my most profitable customers. Maybe they're going after the lower end customer that I'm not interested in right now. But then all of a sudden, they they kind of cut their teeth, figure out how to be competitive, serving that segment of the market. And then by the time they do go after your core business, now you're facing a much more formidable competitor. So I really think you have to be ready. You have to start to transform yourself. You have to look at your own business, disrupt yourself, do those things that are really going to make you fit for growth to uh, to compete in this market. And if we were to take an industry such as, let's say, fintech, can you share any insights around translating that digital transformation within the fintech industry? Yeah, I think fintech is interesting um, for, for a couple of reasons. One, obviously, financial services has always been a technology product. Um, you know, it's been virtualized for a really long time. You know, the idea that uh, you've got, you know, hard currency sitting in a vault somewhere that's, you know, kind of a throwback to, to a time of many, many years ago. Money has been electronic uh, for a really long time. And so technology has always been applied to financial services because of the absolute need to do that. But one of the things that I think you're seeing now in the fintech space is you've really, you've really got kind of two parallel tracks going on. You have a number of fintechs that are going after the consumer directly. And so they're creating, you know, you challenge your banks or payments companies, 
They're going straight after the consumer, competing with traditional banks, putting together offerings that are more compelling and more interesting and are growing. And then you have a number of fintechs who are really going after capabilities and they're looking to sell those capabilities or market those capabilities to the big established technology or financial players. And so you see almost this you know, competition on one side, cooperation on the other side. And I think you're going to see both of those models continue to advance. I think you will see more and more direct to consumer fintechs be successful. But I also think you're going to see a lot of fintechs that are going to focus on helping banks do things like payments better or do things like service their clients better. Certainly you've seen like with Google and some of the capabilities that they're building out, they're building out a lot of finance capabilities that they're then marketing to smaller banks. So those banks can now you know, compete with the big banks with the digital experience. So I think you're going to see a lot of interesting investment going on in the fintech space. And it's going to it's going to go all over the map, you know, institutional, retail, everywhere. You're going to see just, you know, this continued acceleration of the digitization of the finance process. And I'm glad you mentioned the improvement of payments there, because I think that is a huge pain point at the moment, especially how long it takes international payments and business payments to clear so uh, so very often now. So what about the future of payments? How do you see that? And are there any insights you could possibly share around the acceleration of digital transformation in payments? Yeah, I think payments payments is an interesting space. It's still very fragmented. Yeah. When you think about it, you know, billions of dollars have been spent. Technology has really reduced the cost to make a payment. But on the consumer side, you know, the consumers and merchants are still very much operating in a payment structure that was designed 75 years ago. Merchants are still paying 2.75% of a transaction to clear. Consumers aren't paying, but they're really not getting the extra benefit of the fact that technology has reduced the cost. What you've seen is, you know, big credit card companies have tried to, um, to give you lots of rebates and refunds and benefits to signing up, you know, high net worth customers. Um, but they're really, no, nobody's really attacked that core uh, costs, right? So I think one of the things you're going to see, I think on the consumer side, is you're going to start to see people figure out a way to bring down that core cost to make it better. I think to your point on the, on the corporate side, payments are still challenged by currency fluctuation, by the need, you know, you think about wire transfer or using SWIFT or, you know, all of the different capabilities that you have to interact with if you're, if you have an international supply chain to try to fund that supply chain through the payments process. I ultimately think that that is where blockchain and crypto, especially as you're starting to see more and more central banks and large banks get into that space. I think as that technology starts to get further evolved, further adopted, I think that's where you'll start to see lower cost, real-time payments, cross-border, cross-currency. And that's, you know, there's a huge economic benefit there. You think about the amount of money that uh, multinationals have to spend in order to move the money around that they need to move. You know, I'm building building products in China and selling them in Europe, I have to fund all of that. And that's an incredible drag on the economy because of the expense they have to pay to the international banking system to make all that happen. So I really think it's it's blockchain is probably the ultimate technology there that will drive that cost down, improve the quality, make it more real time. And then you'll really be able to build a lot of innovation on top of that, right? Because then now it's not just, you, you think about, and the consumer side, the way payments are embedded into the transaction, you know, when you ride an Uber or you buy something on Amazon or you buy something on Apple, you don't even think about how you're paying it. So I think as that technology advances that you're going to start to see more and more of that kind of, you know, the payment itself is obfuscated from the overall transaction experience. And I think you'll see that on the corporate side as well, as these technologies start to get more and more adopted. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And over the last few months, I've started to see more businesses and indeed banks starting to talk much more about the importance of digital payments. So it'd be interesting where all this leads. But as somebody that's working right in the heart of this space, I've got to ask, what is it that you find most exciting about EKI's Shift Happens campaign and indeed the road ahead in general? What excites you? I think, you know, to me, one of the most exciting things is just the fact that there's so much going on and that that everyone is 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 trying to figure this out. And it's just a great opportunity to have tremendous conversations with our clients. You know, I, I, one of the things I love about the campaign is 
it has really allowed us to, to reach out to anyone and anywhere and just have a conversation. It's not about selling. It's not about you know, trying to market our capabilities. It's really about, let's have a conversation. Let's, let's talk about what we're seeing going on in the industry. Let's hear from our clients what they're seeing and really have a good dialogue. And then, you know, I think what you learn from that dialogue is really have a deep understanding of what people care about, what they're thinking, what are their biggest concerns. And I think that really helps us as a service provider to try to understand, you know, what do I need to do to try to help make my clients more successful? What can I do to um, to help them figure it out, right? Because I, I think there's, while there's tremendous opportunity out there and it's all very exciting, it's also a lot of threat, right? Because companies are going to find that, you know, from this competition, not everyone's going to be successful. And I think there's a fair amount of anxiety out there in the business community. And I think having these kind of educational conversations helps address some of that anxiety more head on. And you talk about, well, why are you concerned? What is making you reluctant to make this investment? What about you know your track record in this space? And how can we help you try to really improve the quality of your investments? You know, One of the things we really try to do is help clients look at their investments in digital and think about it as a as an investment, right? You're going to spend a ton of money. You're going to try to build some capability. You're expecting a certain amount of return. And how do you evaluate that in, in the right context so that you're making the right investment and you're getting the right result? And we really try to help clients think about that in a, you know, maybe in a different way than they have in the past. Well, I've loved chatting with you today, but I'm conscious we've covered quite a lot of ground in 20, 25 minutes today. But for anyone listening that would like to find out more about the Shift Happens campaign, more details on EKI Digital, or even contact your team, what's the best way of doing that? Yeah, you can go to www.eki-digital.com. We have hashtag Shift Happens out there. I'm on Twitter at, at CSRig. I'm on LinkedIn. I think, you know, we're, we're, there's lots of places, but uh, if you just go out to our site, you can interact with us directly on the site, see us out on Twitter, see, our, see the stuff that we're producing and, uh, you know, join the dialogue. Fantastic. Well, I'll add all those links on the blog post that will accompany this just to make it easy for everyone to get involved there. Because I, I love how passionate you guys are on educating businesses and how they can thrive during this every increasing digital shift that's currently underway. And your great work in how you're spearheading this too. So thanks for joining me and sharing that with me today. Great. Thank you. I really appreciate it. A huge thank you to Chris for sharing his insights today. I do love that solutions, not problems approach. I think it's so much more refreshing than the doom and gloom that I constantly see on TV. And hearing about how to plan for that ongoing shift when it happens and how it's never been easier to be smarter and faster and volatility plus technology acceleration equals a reason to start now. So all that and the future of the acceleration of digital transformation in payments, incredibly exciting topics. But I want to continue building this more positive narrative every single day on this podcast. And to do that, I need your input too. So please keep your questions, insights, pictures to come on the show coming over to me by emailing me techblogwriter at outlook.com. My website is techblogwriter.co.uk. Keep them coming over. I'll keep the show going and maybe, just maybe, we can make the world a better place one day at a time. You might say I'm a dreamer, but hey, I'm not the only one. So thanks for listening. And until next time, don't be a stranger. Thank you for listening to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast with Neil C. Hughes. Remember, technology works best when it brings people together.